Well, good morning, y'all. I'm back with another video. And I'm sorry I haven't been getting them out, but I've been really busy. I've been working really hard for an old man. And what have I been doing? <laughs> That's what I've been doing. Two weeks ago, I had a big stack, three big stacks of lumber. And now I have a building and a little stack of lumber and a little stack of plywood and a very, very tiny. This is all of the scrap from this building. <laughs> How is that possible? Well, it's possible because I designed the building to be efficient. So these buildings are three sheets of plywood wide, two and a half sheets of plywood this direction. And when I get finished, I will have a half a sheet of plywood, OSB, sorry, left over as scrap. The last couple of days, I've been putting this roof on. This roof is the two by six tongue and groove southern yellow pine and it is very persnickety it is very challenging to work with it is very crooked and twisted and not very happy and you can see when it goes together you can see these gaps where it goes up and down and this overhang, this four foot overhang is formed just by the strength of the boards cantilevering out past the building. And so what's gonna happen today, and I started it yesterday, is I'm gonna use a clamp to pull these boards together and I'll put a screw in to hold them up so that they're all in a straight line. Before I do that, it's really up and down. I guess you can see that. Afterwards, it's a straight line. And I'll pop a chalk line all the way down the length of this 34 foot building and I'll cut all this off to a perfectly straight line. And then I've taken some, some more pine and I've ripped this piece that will get screwed onto the ends. And I'll put screws on the ends of all these boards and that will hold them all in alignment so that I can then remove this temporary two by. The way I put these on is, and I'll show you on the inside, there's just a ridge beam, a rim joist along the top edge and a rim joist along this bottom edge, this wall and then one beam down the center. And these boards span five feet in between support members without any sag at all. And then they're visible from underneath. The way I put them on is I temporarily screw this two by four to the roof. And then I use these pipe clamps to pull the next board up tight. And if you can look down these boards, you'll see that they're perfectly straight. And I put them in perfectly tight. I didn't leave any room for expansion. And that's because I measured the moisture content of these boards at around 15 to 18%, even though they're kiln dried, which means they're gonna actually shrink. The ones that are exposed to the outdoor environment, like in the breezeway and on this overhang, they'll settle in to around 11 or 12% moisture content over time. And so they'll shrink a little bit. The ones inside will shrink substantially more. They'll end up at around 6% after the first few winters. The winters uh, dry out the moisture content of the wood because moisture content in wood is based on well, equilibrium moisture content. So 
That's very important, the EMC, the equilibrium moisture content is the moisture content that the wood will settle at over time. And that's based on the average relative humidity that the wood finds itself at. And so it's important when you're making, when you're building buildings where you have solid lumber like this, it's important to understand that a lot of times people will put in spacers when they put in a wood floor without ever checking the moisture content of the wood floor. Well, that's how we've always done it. What's really important to do is to measure the moisture content of the wood and know what it is. And then it's important to know um, what the moisture content's going to be, what the equilibrium moisture content is going to be. So we get wood flooring at 8% and it's going to end up at 5 to 6% over time. And yet they put these spacers in to allow for expansion. And the only way that they're going to get expansion is if they have a very unusual interior environment, not a normal interior environment for our climate. And or if they have a water event, if they have a flooding event. And if they have a flooding event, no amount of spacing is, that they would do is going to be enough to keep the floor from buckling. It will buckle anyway if they have a flood event. So it's hard to get, a, it's hard to get across to people that are installing flooring that they need to do that. They'll say, oh, I wanna put penny spacers in. Well, have you checked the moisture content of the wood? Well, it's dry. It's very important that we take a very close look at these things because we need to, we can understand the science of this and we need to use that to our benefit. All right, back to the project. So I've installed all these boards. I'm gonna trim off the ends and put the edge band on them and then I'm gonna dry them in. And then I'm gonna make a determination as to whether or not to go ahead and put the insulation up on top and get the next layer of decking on and dry it in. And I think I will. Our first chance, it's Tuesday, and our first chance of rain is Saturday right now. So that gives me plenty of time to go ahead and <clears throat> get the insulation up on top of this roof. Remember this, this roof decking, or if you're new to the channel, this roof decking is going to be exposed inside the building. Well, let's take a look at that. So in this breezeway, we're gonna have it exposed. That's very lovely. And then inside the solar shed, also exposed. And there's the intermediate beam. So you've got the Rim joist here, it's on top of this wall. You've got one intermediate beam that spans the width of the room, and you have one rim joist that sits on top of the wall down at the bottom edge. And then this decking spans all the way. And there'll be no insulation inside the roof. It'll all be up on top. And so this will just be exposed. We'll put an intumescent paint on it like we did at the solar shed at my house. I've used, whoop, I've used uh, OSB as the sheathing and I've done solid OSB sheathing everywhere. And I'm gonna touch a little bit on the beginnings of how I want to make this building perform. Now this is a modified bitumen membrane with a foil face. And it is designed as a roofing membrane, actually, with a 10-year warranty. You can put this on top of your, I think originally it was designed to, to put a, as a re-roof on a mobile home. You spread this over the top of the mobile home and the foil reflects the sun and protects the membrane from the heat of the sun and they give a 10-year warranty on it. Well, I've been using this to cover my buildings now for about 20 years. This is a modified bitumen that's on a foil scrim. Now, on my buildings, I 
only use this foil face if I'm going to put all the insulation inside the walls, which I don't like to do. I like to put all my insulation on the outside of the walls. And if I put all my insulation on the outside of the walls, I can use a less expensive membrane. This membrane is, well, it's, I won't even give you prices on it right now because it's, it's uh, unusually expensive. I don't know if you've noticed, but electric wire has gotten very expensive. PVC pipe has gotten very expensive. Appliances are difficult to find. And my understanding is the reason for that is because a lot of damage occurred to the refineries that provide um, different products other than gasoline and diesel fuel. They provide a lot of products that we use to manufacture things. So right now it's very difficult to find polyisocyanurate foam insulation. I managed to find some through connections and loyalty and such, but it was difficult and a lot of people can't find it. Roofers that rely on it to put on these commercial buildings are simply unable to find it at all. And that's because during the ice apocalypse of a year ago, there was a lot of damage that occurred to those refineries because they were not prepared for the <coughs> extremely cold temperatures that they had. That's why we're having, according to my friend who owns an appliance store, we're having a very difficult time finding appliances because the olefin plant was damaged. And so they can't get enough of the raw material that they use to make the plastic liners for the inside of the refrigerators and freezers of some manufacturers. That's why you'll find limited models available. They just cut back. I can't find the vinyl siding I'm using, they have about half as many colors as normal. They just don't have the raw product that they need on top of the expanding demand that they have for their products. They don't have the raw materials to make them. So it's made everything really expensive. And because this modified bitumen is basically a waste product of the refineries, that's just the sludge that's left after they make diesel and gasoline and because of that comes from those refineries there is a shortage of the raw material just like there is for the isocyanates that make the polyisocyanurate foam insulation. So this is the garden shed and I've uh, taken you through here when the walls were open but now it's a lot easier to see the beauty involved in this building. So I will put some polyisocyanurate in above this wall. I've made, on the table saw, I've made some wedges out of this polyisocyanurate. Like this. That will go in where this wedge-shaped void is. If you look straight up the wall, you see that this is a wedge-shaped void, so that'll go in there, but I also put that on the outside in the same wedge shape before the sheathing went on. And uh, actually, I can show you that right here. So there's a wedge on the outside of the beam because the beam is canted at that angle. And then there's a wedge on the inside of the beam. So, and then on top of that, we'll have an R3 of extruded polystyrene that goes on the outside. Well, let's talk about this air tightening. So in the building that I usually make, I completely cover the building with this modified bitumen membrane. It's... Uh, it makes a complete airtight seal because we run it down onto the concrete and seal it to the concrete. We run it all the way up the wall and we run it out onto the roof and seal everything with it. We run it from the wall onto the doors and onto the windows to seal those in. And 
Because all of the air tightening is done on the outside of the building, it's very easy to inspect. In a normal house, and most people aren't aware of this, but in a normal house, the way we air tighten our buildings is with something called a drywall air barrier approach. And the drywall air barrier approach is what causes us to caulk electrical outlets to sheetrock. Who thought that was a good idea? We're gonna take broken gypsum dust and we're gonna take a plastic box and then we're gonna use latex caulk to caulk that because that's gonna seal that electrical box to the drywall. But what about the holes in the back of the box where the wires come through? Those don't get sealed. So caulking the box to the gypsum dust, which never worked anyway, that's, uh, that's folly. It doesn't result in an airtight building. And there are a lot of approaches that, of things that we do with a normal building to try to seal at the level of the drywall. And because buildings are very complex on the inside, it's very difficult as a supervisor, project manager, to uh, inspect to see if it was done properly. So you might be familiar with the foam that gets put along the bottom edge of the, of the bottom plate. So, so we caulk with foam, we caulk the bottom edge of the bottom plate because the drywall comes down and quote, seals to that bottom plate, but it doesn't. In a proper drywall air barrier approach, the, G the gypsum board should be caulked to every stud and every bottom plate and every top plate, but it can't be. And then you have all these areas that are gapped and you have intersecting walls that come in as T's and those are difficult to seal. You have stairwells where you might put normal construction would be a two by six gets mounted to the wall and then a two by 12 stringer that has the treads and risers cut into it gets mounted to that. And then the drywall comes in in the gap behind and that cannot get sealed. So the drywall air barrier approach isn't just difficult to do properly, it's actually impossible to do properly. Now, a lot of buildings get around part of those problems by spraying <coughs> half pound density foam inside the walls. <coughs> now that does solve some of the problems or at least reduce some of the problems. And you end up with a building that is a little tighter than a building that is done with fiberglass insulation and caulk and foam, where they are, you know, they foam the holes. So, so let's say you're trying to use drywall with your air barrier, and you drill a hole up through here and you put a wire through it. So if air leaks into this wall from outside, it now has a path through that hole. Well, okay, so that's why they put foam in all of those holes. And then where they have fur downs, where, where you might come down with some drywall and back to the wall and a cabinet might mount underneath it, where they do that, they seal the fur downs to prevent the spread of fire but they don't seal the fur downs to prevent the movement of air. And one of the problems with the movement of air through our wall structures is in a climate like ours, a lot of the year when air moves in and out of the walls, moisture moves in and out of the walls. And when moisture finds a cold surface, it condenses. And so, more on that later in another video, we're going to talk about movement of moisture through walls, but
just suffice to say for this video that we want to air tighten our buildings as much as we can. Does a house have to breathe? No, a house does not have to breathe. And I don't even know what they mean when they say breathe. They don't either. Do they mean a house has to let air move in and out? Or some people might mean, it might mean that water vapor has to pass through, through diffusion. But in any case, a house doesn't have to breathe. A house has to be managed. And what we want to do is we want to manage the envelope of the building. Now, if you cover the entire building with a modified bitumen membrane, you will have an airtight building. Air tightness standards, 0.25 air changes per hour, air tightness standards are designed around what people can do with a cock gun, not around what a building needs to perform well. They basically, the code officials and the people on the committees that form the codes, they basically did a building with the methods that they had, they measured it, and they said, this is going to be our air tightness standard. My buildings are 10 times that tight. They have one tenth of the leakage of the typical airtight house, and maybe one hundredth the leakage of a poorly built or older built house. Now, what that means is my buildings perform at a much higher level. So, what am I going to do on this building? Because if I cover all of this building with membrane and put all the insulation on the outside of it, it will cost a little bit more. And is it needed? Well, I'm going to say in this case, since this is a garden shed and a solar shed, I'm going to say no. I'm going to go for a compromise. Now, this is not a compromise that I would ever recommend for a residential building where people are living in it a large building that creates uh, a lot of energy demands. But in this case, we have a lot of perimeter footage, but not a lot of square footage. So in, because we have a lot of walls for the amount of floor space we have, I'm going to go ahead and do this in a way that makes more economic sense for the use case. What I'm going to do, I'm still going to try to make an airtight building, but I'm going to take, and this is what I've done on my own solar shed, but I'm going to take and I'm going to run a strip of the membrane to seal it at the bottom, and then I'm going to run number 30 felt paper over that, now this OSB is a pretty good air barrier, as long as it's put in in such a way that it can be. Now, sure, you have joints. You might have gaps. You might have somebody's boo-boo where they cut it wrong and put a little piece in. That never happens. But we'll seal those up. And then we'll use the same membrane around the doors and windows because that's where a lot of leakage occurs. And then we'll put a layer of extruded polystyrene over the whole thing which is another air barrier. So you've got the air barrier of the OSB. You've got the air barrier of the felt paper. It's got laps and seams. Then we're going to put a layer of extruded polystyrene. That's the pink stuff if it's made by, by Owens Corning. Or the blue stuff. 
think it's made by Dupont. It's the same thing. Made the same way. Passes an E84 flame spread test, called a Class A fire rating. So we'll put that over, and then we'll put another layer over that of the insulated vinyl siding. All those layers together are going to make this building pretty airtight. And it'll perform pretty well. It'll perform very well. And that's a, that's a compromise, because we, if we understand the problem and we understand the toolbox that we have at our disposal, we can make the right decisions and we can design for the use case. So that's what we're doing here. And I'm gonna thank you all for being patient with me about how quickly I can get these videos out. Beautiful day here. I just wanted to get this roof on. It's been very uh, challenging for me doing this project by myself. I uh, have had a painter here who has sanded all these boards on the ground because otherwise he was going to have to sand them overhead and uh, didn't want to have to put him through that. All right, well, I'm going to be bringing you some more. Thank you for your patience. Please subscribe. You can like the video too if you liked it. I don't expect this video to be really popular. It's not about batteries. But it is important that we understand how to build these buildings so that they can perform and require fewer batteries, fewer inverters, and fewer solar panels than typically built buildings. All right. Thank you very much. I look forward to the next one. Bye-bye.